2021, Carnival Cruise Line will introduce its newest largest ship to date, the Mardi Gras. Taking her name from Carnival's first ship, the new Mardi Gras will measure 180,000 gross tons and have a full guest capacity of 6,630. The 17-deck LNG-powered vessel will boast the first seagoing roller coaster, a massive water park, and numerous dining venues. This state-of-the-art newcomer is literally six and a half times larger than her namesake, a beautiful former ocean liner that often gets misremembered by cruise industry revisionists. The graceful, immaculate first Mardi Gras, while a far cry from today's balconied behemoths, was no old tub as she is often called by many who never even stepped foot on board. Way back in 1993, after Carnival announced it was retiring its first ships, the 1961-built Mardi Gras and the 1956-built Carnival, I made a special trip to Port Canaveral to visit both former ocean liners. At that time, they were offering three- and four-night party cruises to the Bahamas. Both ships were still beautifully maintained, and in the case of the Mardi Gras, still largely original after two decades of service with Carnival. And now, here is the Mardi Gras story. In the late 1950s, Canadian Pacific Lines, a venerable company whose transatlantic passenger services began in 1903, ordered its next flagship from the Vickers Armstrong Shipyard near Newcastle in Northeast England. Laid down in January of 1959, the new ship, to be named Empress of Canada, gradually began to take shape. She would be the first CP liner to boast a bulbous bow that would both improve her hydrodynamic efficiency and reduce pitching on the North Atlantic. The twin screw liner would be powered by Pamatrata turbines that would achieve a maximum speed of 23 knots, two more than required on the Liverpool to Montreal run. On May 10, 1960, the Empress of Canada was ready for launching by the wife of Canada's then Prime Minister, John Diefenbacher. The ship would then spend the next 10 months fitting out. She would be similar in appearance to the recently built Empress of Britain of 1956 and the Empress of England of 1957, but with two extra decks of superstructure and a more modern funnel. The Empress of Canada was built for CP's Liverpool to Quebec and Montreal service, but also for off-season cruising. At 27,300 gross tons and 650 by 86.6 feet, she carried 192 first and 856 tourist class passengers, as well as 510 crew. The Empress of Canada sailed off on her trials in March of 1961, arriving in Liverpool later that month for inspections prior to her maiden voyage, which began on April 4, 1961. In her early years, the handsome ship sported a buff funnel with CP's red and white checkered flag logo. The Empress's first-class public rooms were on promenade deck, with the exception of the Salle Frontenac dining room on restaurant deck. Her first-class suites and staterooms were fitted out in lavish wood veneers. An indoor pool, which was ideal on cold crossings, was shared by both classes, along with the dedicated cinema. Tourist class had its own deck of public rooms, which were of a comparable standard to those in first class. This made the ship's transition to cruising all the more viable. By the late 1960s, the demand for transatlantic sailings was being decimated by aircraft. The Empress of Canada was given another refit, emerging with a stylized green logo on her funnel that would serve her well in her next incarnation. The Empress undertook more cruises, and by 1969 she was the last surviving member of the Canadian Pacific Fleet. She enjoyed high occupancy, in large part due to her wide open decks, user-friendly layout, and well-appointed public rooms. Nonetheless, Canadian Pacific made the sudden decision to withdraw from passenger service and offered the Empress of Canada for sale in November of 1971. 
Meanwhile, Miami-based shipping entrepreneur Ted Arison had just lost out on his bid for the two laid-up Cunard liners, Carmania and Franconia. While he was in the UK, Arison was persuaded by a naval architect friend to inspect the Empress of Canada, and the result is now cruising history. Arison immediately purchased the ship and sailed her off to Miami to launch his newfound Carnival cruise line. As the Mardi Gras, the ship departed on her maiden voyage on March 11, 1972, with 300 travel agents and media among her passenger complement. The deep-drafted Mardi Gras grounded on a sandbar at the harbor entrance, where she spent the night as efforts were made to refloat her. Cleverly, all bar service was gratis, and the following morning, filled with happy guests, the Mardi Gras was freed and continued on her voyage. Carnival's now ubiquitous logo came about through sheer frugality. With no funds for a new logo, the green Canadian Pacific funnel markings were painted red and blue with a wide white C. It was later modified into a thinner C after Canadian Pacific protested the blatant poaching of its trademark. The ship's early years were tenuous, but thanks to a lively shipboard experience and a great value for the money, the Mardi Gras reputation steadily grew until she became the most popular ship in Miami's seven-day cruise market. In 1973, the Mardi Gras embarked on an ambitious 41-night voyage to Israel, and in 1978, she inaugurated Carnival's West Coast presence with a brief season of cruises. As a young enthusiast, I visited Mardi Gras during her maiden call to Los Angeles and was impressed with her beautiful woodwork and classic ocean liner ambience as much as I was her spotless maintenance. I would next encounter her in Florida in the late 1980s, affirming my admiration for her beautiful architecture and interior design. The Mardi Gras had nine passenger decks beginning at the top with observation deck, which overlooked the bow from the flying bridge and continued aft beyond a windscreen via terraces that surrounded the mass platform. The next level, Sun Deck, began with the wheelhouse and bridge wings. The interior portion of Sun Deck featured a gymnasium that was installed in the former First Class Games Deck and solariums with seating on either side. Farther aft, the sun deck's teak line terraces stretched past the funnel to a large sunning space that overlooked the stern.
Sports Deck began with the former first-class deck area overlooking the bow that became a children's play deck on Mardi Gras. After the officers' accommodations on Sports Deck, the original Empress of Canada children's playroom remained unchanged. The playroom's melamine art panels were salvaged when the ship was scrapped in India in 2004. At the far aft end of Sports Deck, there is the Alfresco Sea View Snack Bar. Promenade deck consisted of all former first-class public areas and narrow exterior boat deck promenades. The interior portion of promenade deck began with El Patio Grande, the enclosed former first-class promenade that overlooked the bow. The showboat lounge featured backlit Art Nouveau-inspired panels by Carnival's then-architect Joseph Farkas. This space was originally the St. Lawrence Club and was paneled in figured birch and featured murals of the St. Lawrence River. The Showboat Club Casino, which was locked on this visit, was originally the Empress of Canada's stately Mayfair room. It was paneled in lush sycamore and gave the impression of being a circular space thanks to its recessed dome and curved bay windows. The windows were salvaged when the ship was broken up in India in 2004. The balcony level of the Grand Ballroom featured nickel bronze CPN sets for Canadian Pacific in the staircase and Art Deco nickel maple leaves in the balcony balustrade. At the far aft end of Promenade Deck, another sheltered terrace was home to the Tropical Bar, named for Carnival's first new build. This space was formerly the tourist class nursery that was originally called the Den. Part of the Mardi Gras enduring legacy is that every carnival ship that followed, until very recently, had an Empress deck. On Mardi Gras, this level began with an open terrace that overlooked the bow. The interior portion of Empress Deck began with former first-class cabins and suites. On each landing of the forward stair tower, there were beautiful etched mirrors with cobalt glass insets, framed in nickel. Polished handrails were also made of nickel.
finite enclosed promenades stretched aft along either side of Empress Deck. The Zebrano paneled former first class boutiques and salon area was for the most part unchanged on the Mardi Gras. In its original role, the dual level Canada room served both first and tourist class passengers. It became the Grand Ballroom showroom on the Mardi Gras. This spectacular space was paneled in figured willow, bubinga, and mahogany, and like the rest of the ship, designed by Scottish-based J. Patrick McBride and London-based Paul Gell. In each corner, etched glass screens of Canadian flora were created by Canadian artist Nan Elson. Directly after the Grand Ballroom, the handsome Carousel Lounge and Bar was originally the tourist class Windsor Room. The Zebrano and Laurel Wood paneling was of the finest quality, and in the room's original incarnation, the forward bulkheads were covered in a lemon-toned leather. Another lobby, originally a tourist class boutique area, followed the Carousel Lounge. At the far aft end of Empress Deck, the Point After Club was the Mardi Gras nightclub and disco. It was originally the tourist class Banff Club, boasting lush woodwork and mosaic panels that were painted black in the carnival era. In the aft exterior portion of Empress Deck, the outdoor pool replaced a temporary pool that was housed in a cargo hold during the ship's Canadian Pacific era. The next level, upper deck, was mostly devoted to accommodations with former first class cabins forward and tourist class aft. The upper deck entrance hall was the former first class bureau and like the rest of the ship, paneled in rich woods with polished nickel fittings. A long central passage on upper deck led aft to the Bourbon Street Arcade, which was originally a tourist class boutique. If you look closely, you can see more of Nan Elson's Canadian flora etchings in its glass panels. Yet another open teak line terrace was located on aft upper deck. Main deck offered more accommodations and the leather panel two deck cinema, which was unchanged from its Canadian Pacific origins. The fantail and a mooring area were located at the far aft end of main deck.
Riviera Deck, formerly Restaurant Deck, originally had two dining rooms, but the former first-class Salle Frontenac was converted to cabins early in the Mardi Gras career. The Flamingo Dining Room on after Riviera Deck was one of the few spaces to receive Joe Farkas's full-on modernization. Its new look featured his signature marble surfacing and bold Tivoli lighting. This space was originally the handsome tourist-class Carlton restaurant, named after Sir Guy Carlton, the former governor of Quebec. At the bottom of the ship, the coral pool was locked during my visit, but it remained unchanged from its Canadian Pacific days. After disembarking Mardi Gras, I spent a couple hours on board her equally historic fleetmate Carnival, then waited to see which one would sail first. I got very lucky when the Carnival was the first to depart, sailing past the Mardi Gras in a stellar meeting of the former empresses. Fortunately, I would get to see both ships again in their various post-Carnival incarnations. Let there be no mistake that the ship that built the Carnival Cruise Empire was a beautifully designed and maintained former ocean liner that was much loved by her passengers and crew. Long live the legacy of the old Mardi Gras, and here's to an equally prosperous career for her namesake. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to the Midship Century YouTube page, and don't forget to hit like. Thanks again.